Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a ranked perfumer portfolio video and it's going to be on one of the all-time greats as far as I'm concerned, Guy Robert. And uh, I've done a Guy Robert perfumer's portfolio video. I'm going to rank his creations today. It's basically going to be a top five with a couple honorary mentions because there's some controversy, controversy as to... Um, who perfumed what, and so I'm just gonna throw them, throw some extras in as an honor, as an honorable mention. I did have to go to work all day. I'm also recovering from the COVID still. Uh, so drink of the day is not wine or tea or coffee. It's Pedialyte. Um, so this is uh, keeping me well hydrated. But first, before we do that, I actually would like to do um, a quick unboxing. And this is thanks to my good friend, Jeff, who already did so much. Uh, he sent me a full bottle of Arso, which I absolutely fell in love with. Very, very kindly sent me. Oh my God, this fragrance is so good. I need to uh, discover more from this house. He also sent me a bottle of 683 Extra, which I thought I would hate. I actually don't hate it. Um, I don't like it anywhere near as much as Arso, but uh, I do not hate this as much as I thought I would. I don't hate it as much as Ganymede, let's put it that way. It's not as weird as Ganymede either, but um, I don't really understand the hype for this one yet either, but I need to wear it more. I, haven't, I have not worn this as my scent of the day yet, and he very kindly sent me a partial bottle of um, the only YSL, I guess, I don't know what this range is called, um, their private blend, privé, whatever you want to call it, range, uh, tuxedo. Uh, he said he punted the cap across the room one day and it busted on him. But um, this is the only full bottle of uh, YSL's private uh, range that I have in my collection, thanks to Jeff. So Jeff was has been very, very kind to me. He also sent me a big fat sample of... Um, a Donna Karen fragrance called Fuel for Men, which I have the original DK for Men, I think from 94. Uh, and he sent me the rebranded Fuel for Men, I think from 2008. So he has been more than kind, let's say, in what he sent me recently. And he said, hey man, there's another package at the post office waiting for you. I was like, dude, you are you are way too kind. Thank you. Thank you for your, uh, thank you for your generosity and your contributions. And... Um, allowing me to get my nose on stuff because it's expensive you know when you're you're not sponsored like I am you just sort of do it for the uh, love of for the love of the game if you will and um, it can it can be an expensive little hobby but um, so thank you to everyone who has sent me something you see my row of samples up here sort of waiting to be discussed on the channel um, I did talk about a new house on the channel yesterday called Sherwood and um, the owner of the house, Prakar Gupta, reached out and he said that, thank you very much for your video. In fact, SAR has um, gotten so much interest, it's almost sold out. So if you are interested in securing a bottle, I would say write him on Instagram and make that happen because there is a limited amount. But I'll be reviewing more from his house soon. It is uh, definitely a house worth looking into, I'll tell you that. So um, let us dive into what Jeff very kindly sent me. So you've got some samples here. And the first thing is, oh geez. So this is a, um, actually I've never, I've never held a uh, Slumber House bottle in my hands before. So this is a first. This is uh, Norn. Are you guys familiar with this one? So this is apparently one of Slumber House's, oh it's so like deep and thick and rich. I love those type of perfumes. I mean, look at the juice color. It's almost like, um, it's almost like red wine. You know, it's so dark purple, black. Um, and Norn, I think I might have a sample or two that someone very kindly sent me, but, um, Norn, uh, I don't know enough about Slumber House's bottles to tell you whether this is the version from 2021 or 2012. Um, Jeff, if you would just leave it in the comments below. I'm guessing it's the 2021 version. Um, but this is a house that I would love to dive into more. There's actually, um, they did a creation called, I think it was called Sixes and Sevens or something along those lines. 
uh, it was an oud fragrance that I'd love to smell. Um, so they, it's a house that I need to definitely look into more. They even have some freshies I'd love to smell, like pear and olive. I know Mark from the Robes 08 channel loved pear and olive. Um, so a house that I'm really excited getting to wear and talk about on the channel with you guys. So thank you, Jeff. Very, very kind of you. This is, these, are, these are not cheap. Slumber houses are not cheap at all. So very kind. Um, and then we have this. A very generous fat decant. There's actually a couple fat decants in here. Um, this one is Come to Papa. As I completely just get angry and rip it open, this is uh, a Grossmith. Hasa no Hana. Um, actually, funny that this arrived um, in my lap today because. I was just telling Rich Mitch today, man, I would love to smell these Grossmiths. Uh, he did a video, my, my brother uh, from another mother, uh, Mr. Rich Mitch, he did a um, Grossmith video today, and I actually sent him a WhatsApp message saying I would love to smell some of these Grossmith fragrances, and then here we are. I am literally holding one in my hand for the very first time, so that is, uh, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, um, Jeff. And then finally, here's the fat decant. The fat decant, which I don't know what this is, because it is hand labeled by Jeff. And it is, ah, Christian Dior's Vetiver. I was saying that I wanted to smell this because this is one of those Paris exclusives. It's like, um, it is a, how, how would you describe it? Um, it is, a uh, vetiver and coffee fragrance and apparently it's one of those it's in the privé line it came out in 2010 it's one of Demache's early privés those were his best works by the way I have one coming I have a vintage one coming that I've been hunting down for a long time and uh, my friend Rudy from time to musk up sold me a um, privé bottle of, of a vintage Dior before the C and the D were linked together that I've been hunting for a long, long time. I'm very excited to finally add that to the collection. So you'll see an unboxing of that coming soon. But this is awesome. This is, um, look how generous. Thank you, Jeff. Very, very kind. Sicilian grapefruit, Robusta coffee and Haitian vetiver. Smells like an amazing vetiver fragrance from the, just from the barrel, from the atomizer. Um, and I've been digging vetiver lately. It's a, uh, it's, it's funny, vetiver is a note that early on in my journey, I was like, I don't like it, you know, it's not my thing. And I think a lot of people go down that road where the first time they try it, or let's say the first few years of their journey, vetiver is just, it's not like the catchy, flashy, you know, note. And it can take some time, it can take some maturity, I think, to really appreciate vetiver. And so this is, this will be awesome. I'm going to do a video on, on these for sure. So thank you, Jeff. Very, very kind, my friend. Let me put these up here or... Actually, you know what? I'm going to leave them out because I want to make sure I put them in the description of the video. So I'm just going to leave them right here for now. I will put them away once the video is over. So uh, let's do scent of the day and then we'll get into this Guy Robert extravaganza because he's a uh, perfumer who deserves to be celebrated, I think. And uh, But today I wore this little bad boy as my scent of the day. It's a creation by uh, Jacques Cavalier and this is Opus 5. So Opus 5, uh, this is what the vintage bottles basically look like. The new bottles look like this. And they have a name. Um, so the new bottles look exactly like this. This is uh, Opus 13. This is Silver Oud. But uh, the Opus 5 bottles now no longer look like this. They now look like this. And it says Opus 5. Sim uh, Woods Symphony is the name that they gave Opus 5. The Opus has never had a um, name before. That's a new thing that um, the Fishman, Reno Re Salman, ended up um, adding to the Opus collection. And there's a new Opus coming called King Blue. So, uh, yeah, maybe one of the worst Amouage names I've ever heard. King Blue. I'm guessing it's going to be a uncut gem moment for that brand of Amouage, like uh, 
the fish man is, is officially going to bury the House of Amouage. But I will say this. One thing that gives me promise about King Blue is the scent is priced retail at $500, which is the same price that Opus um, 13 is priced at because of the Oud. So maybe the Oud's going to be fantastic quality, but God, $500 retail for King Blue. I don't know, um, but that's just me talking out loud. Um, but Opus 5 is my scent of the day in the vintage bottle. It's a Jacques Cavalier creation. It's basically this brilliant iris that... If you're an iris lover, I would urge you to smell this because even though you may look at the notes and think, ah, oh, it's a, it's a rose oud, you know, it's an iris rum rose oud fragrance. And it is, it's all of that. But the iris in this might surprise you. It might. The rum is there, but it's not like one of those in your face rum accords. The rum is there, I think, to add sort of this modernity to this iris note. And the iris here is... Uh, many, many things. The iris note in this is very complex. Sometimes I smell it, and I think it's a classic powdery iris note. Many times, though, I smell it, and it's a very cold green type of iris. And I've really enjoyed the way that it... it I wore this to work today as my scent of the day, and um, I really enjoyed it. The only thing I did not enjoy, and this is a 2011 release, so you can't really blame them, you know. It's hard to fast forward a decade and a year and, you know, look back on something that was made, well, 12 years, not just, uh, we're in 2013 now, so 12 years ago, we're in 2013, man, COVID's like rotting my brain, we're in 2023, um, and so, you know, it's hard to look back 12 years on the past and hold them to the same uh, high bar that I would hold them to in, in 2023, if that makes sense, and so my beef with this is that the oud smells like something that you would smell in a like a Arabian oud fragrance like if you've smelled um Arabian oud's cashmere right something like that um that sort of fresh take on oud if you've smelled sort of the way that the oud plays in Arise Ladore's Ocularia Blossom that sort of fresh take on oud that's the way that the oud comes across here and there's nothing wrong with that it's just it's not my favorite type of oud i like my ouds to be dirty and animalic and challenging and all that stuff you know earthy barnyard all of that and the oud here is synthetic smell it doesn't smell like it fits in a fragrance that is 360 dollars retail or whatever this is right it feels like a little lower quality um but wood symphony does work beautiful i mean the the oud is not the star of the show. That's the thing. It's sort of a secondary player, and but it's the only thing that sort of drags the fragrance down. Everything else, the creation, um, you know, this is better, I think, than a lot of the Louis Vuitton exclusives that sell for similar money that Jacques Cavalier has been creating lately. Um, I think that this is better. This is an underrated fragrance. Not my favorite opus, it's not my favorite Opus creation by far. It's actually probably one of my least favorite creations on the Opus side, but it's still that good. That's how that's how good Amouage was when Christopher Chong was firing on all cylinders. So this is Opus 5 Woods Symphony, and it sits in this nice little padded sort of um, felt box. The only thing that's tough about this, it sits perfectly right here. The only thing that's tough, and it has a little stand, is that the box, uh, um, the box is sort of a pain to, to get out. If Especially if you break this or something, there's like no, I mean, you're going to have to dig it out. This thing is a lifesaver. So make sure you put it in the right way or else you'll be struggling to open it. Um, okay, so that is Opus 5 Wood Symphony. So let's talk about Guy Robert. Let's talk a little bit about his sort of um, background, if you will. And, um, you know, he passed away about a decade ago and he is one of the icons of fine French perfumery. You know, when I think about fine French perfumery, I think of people like Edmund Rudnitska and people like Guy Robert. And, um, he made some absolute classics, which we're going to talk about today, but, um, I'll read you a little blurb about his sort of background, and he was born into a legendary perfume family, a family of perfumers, um, and they were, they, uh, actually lived in, and were born in, in Grasse, in the capital of, uh, perfume for the, for the whole world, Grasse, is, Grasse, Grasse is the perfume capital, if you will, and, um, so growing up, he was, like, immersed in this world of fragrances, 
and he inherited his family's passion for creating beautiful scents. So he began his career in the early 1950s, and he joined the prestigious fragrance house of Chanel. He worked under the tutelage of his legendary, um, is it his uncle? Um, let's see. Yes, I must, must be, uh, Henri Robert must be Guy Robert's uncle. Um, I think that's basically how the, the family tree went. And this is where the, um, I would say controversy begins, because if you just Google Guy Robert's name, you're going to find there are some places like Lucky Scent, for example, in the Lucky Scent archives, it basically gives Guy Robert credit for Chanel's Pour Monsieur from 1955, one of the most iconic, masculine, uh, the, the EDT is a Sheepra, the EDP or the EDT Concentre moved away from that classic Sheepra um, construction. But the, uh, the original EDT, um, which is widely credited to Henri Robert, um, there are people out there saying, well, actually, Guy Robert played a much bigger role. He wasn't just the apprentice here. So this is one part of the controversy. <coughs> the second part is this, and I would say, I'm going to say this right now. If it's true, if it ever does come out, if, if the truth comes out, if you will, because if you go to Parfumo and if you go to Fragrantica and, and Base Notes and stuff like that, he doesn't get credit for this. He also doesn't get credit for this. This came out in 1971. This is Chanel's number 19, one of the greatest green fragrances of all time. Um, brilliant galbanum. The, the vintage bottles of this used Iranian, Iranian galbanum, which was uh, extremely hard to source after the war between Iran and Iraq. And so the, uh, bo the bottles had to be sort of changed. They found a different galbanum source, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, this is a vintage bottle and it is absolutely stunning. I prefer the EDT because, you know, it doesn't focus as much on the florals. Like the EDP is a little bit more floral. Um, the EDT focuses a little heavier on the things that I like, like the cold iris and galbanum and the oak mossy base and all of this brilliant stuff in Chanel number 19. Um, and this is a proper green Sheepra. This is part of, um, you know, one of the icons in the 1970s that made the 1970s such a um, hallmark for green fragrances, you know, whenever Frederick Mall did his uh, synthetic jungle creation. Um, he went back and smelled stuff like this in Private Collection by Estee Lauder, and those were like the reference points, you know, and, and the 70s was really known for its green creations, and this is, this is like one of the trailblazers. This is one of the Vanguard fragrances that led the way. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry to sniff in your ear. I might need to put a cough drop in. Um, but... The reason I bring that up is, um... If, if it's true that he is the perfumer, let's say that he played more than just a, you know, AIDS role in creating these, you have to almost say he's one of the greatest perfumers of all time. I mean, I think some people already say he is the greatest perfumer of all time. <clears throat> there are definitely people in the Guy Robert camp that say he is the greatest perfumer of all time because of the five or six fragrances we're going to talk about today that are in my collection. Now, um, so basically what ended up happening in the 1960s is he left Chanel, right? And this came out in 71. So, you know, if he really did leave Chanel in the 60s, then you can't really give him credit for this. But maybe this was, you know, back then they didn't just work on fragrances. Like now I feel like, uh, I wouldn't be surprised to hear a perfumer say they made a fragrance over lunch, you know, with how quick they make stuff nowadays. Back then it wasn't like that. I mean, they took years, sometimes decades, developing fragrances. Um, and so he left Chanel in the 1960s, and he joined the luxurious French house, Hermes, where he played a key role in establishing the brand as a prominent fragrance house. And he created several memorable fragrances for Hermes, including one we're going to talk about uh, very early on in the video, which is one of the most widely considered to be one of the most beautiful floral uh, aldehydic floral fragrances of all time, which follows a theme, which I'm going to also talk about in the video. <laughs> and he went on to create for other prestigious brands like Rochas. I've never spell, smelled, um, 
He did a fragrance for Rochas called Madame Rochas. I've never smelled that one. He also did a fragrance called Monsieur Rochas, um, which I have never smelled. There was also, there's a Monsieur Rochas and there's a Monsieur Rochas Eau de Toilette Concentrate. I would love to smell those too because they came out in 68 and 69. And you know what they make me think of is they make me think of stuff like this, you know? Monsieur de Givenchy and Monsieur de Givenchy Haut Concentrate. I love this stuff. And so I would be very interested to see what the Monsieur Rochas, Monsieur Rochas EDT Concentrate sort of combo was. Um, <coughs> sorry to cough in your ear. I'm going to put a cough drop in. Um, see, at work, I talk all day. Um, and so talking all day at work and then coming home and and putting on the video and then talking some more you know your throat can only take so much recovering from the covid um and so aside from a perfumer apparently Guy Robert was a very talented musician he liked to do things like write he has books that he penned um which he has a perfume book a book on perfumery I would love to read one day he's a very talented musician and a gourmet chef and I know there are people in the fragrance community Big names like Michael Edwards, for example, who really count counted uh, Guy Robert as a dear friend, and they said he was one of the most beautiful human beings and teachers that you know somebody who was into fragrance could have. That he truly had a passion for it <laughs> and a skill, a skill at blending these harmonious, beautiful smells together. He passed away in 2012, so it's been 11 years. Um, and it says that his beautiful fragrances continue to captivate and inspire perfume lovers around the world. Great sort of ending note to, to end that little blurb on. So I'm just going to, before we hop into his fragrances, uh, especially on the women's side of things that he created, there is a trend with Guy Robert that you will find. He had a particular affinity for a fragrance. And I don't know when his love affair with this fragrance began, but I, I could almost say that um, if it's a secret, it's a very badly held secret. And when you smell his work, actually, if you compare it, it's almost like this would be a good, do they have like college theses on perfume? If they do, this would be a hell of a paper for a college student, you know, in, in, uh, to, to write. But, uh, he was obsessed with this. This is a very precious vintage bottle of, uh, L'Envan Arpege. This is the X-ray. This is a hell of a lot of X-ray right here. <laughs> and I actually got this. It was still sealed. I got extremely lucky with this bottle. I didn't realize how lucky until I tried to find another one and pff, not, not even anywhere close. Um, but this, <laughs> this, this came out in the 1920s. Oh my fucking God. Um, <laughs> as far as like, uh, aldehydic florals go um <clears throat> once i really got to know arpege <clears throat> sorry to again sniff in your ear um once i really got to know arpege and wear it and i wear this to bed regularly um i very rarely wear it as my scent of the day because this is a grand perfume so the thing about Guy robert that you'll realize about him when you go through his creations is he liked creating what many in the French perfume circles call grand perfumes. These are ballroom perfumes. These are, you know, capture the room fragrances. That was his style. And there's a very rare unicorn Hermes fragrance he made in the 1950s called Doblis. And I would love, absolutely love to smell Doblis one day. Bottles go for, I don't even know, $10,000, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a bottle. Um, that it is an extremely rare fragrance, hard to find. Um, it's like trying to find some of those old Guerlain's, you know, like, uh, Jedi or, you know, that kind of thing. It, the bottles are extremely, very, very rare, very limited. Um, and then he sort of remade that DNA into what we are going to use as my number five fragrance for this top five countdown. So number five is Kalesh. And I have a little vintage 25 mil bottle that I've been playing with here for a while. And Kalesh, um, 
deserves better than to be at number five. I'll tell you that because it is a brilliant, absolutely brilliant um, aldehydic floral. It is. It's just in my taste. See, um, these are ranked based on my personal taste. And so for me, um, I'm not saying that number one is better than number five, but I'm just saying that I would much rather wear number one and number two over number five. And this is one of those fragrances where um, I'm going to dip a little blotter in here because it's been a while since I've smelled it. <laughs> this is an <clears throat> aldehydic floral sheepra, right? His, 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 his sort of style. Remember I said aldehydic florals were his thing, right? And he... I think he constantly was trying to remake this or not remake it, but remake it in his image. You know, it's almost like, um, is this blotter going to fit? Come on, baby. Let me fold you up. Fold you up. Okay. Get in there, blotter. Yes. <laughs> so... Yes, extremely aldehydic floral opening, and um, you have to remember at the time, Chanel Number no. 5 was selling like hotcakes. This is 1961 this came out. Chanel Number no. 5 had <clears throat> sort of dominated things for, for a long time. Aldehydic florals like Arpege were very popular, and he wanted to add his touch to it. And so what he did with this is he made it surprisingly woody. If you're a guy, I'm telling you, <clears throat> give Kalesh a try. Don't just overlook it because I said it's an aldehydic floral. Because it really, I mean, it is an aldehydic floral, but like right now I'm smelling a lot of the wood notes. So for example, there's cypress and sandalwood and cedar. There's three big wood notes in here. Cypress in the top, a sandalwood cedar base, right? And smelling it on paper, I'm realizing how much the woody notes play a part in this composition. Now on my skin though, my skin tends to bring out more of the bright powders and florals and I don't get as much of the woods as I get on this paper. I think I think if I did, I would like it even more than I do. And and don't get me wrong, I love this fragrance. Um very blessed to have a vintage old bottle, you know, back when they used to stamp stuff like that on there. They don't do stuff like that anymore. <laughs> Um, but there's beautiful florals in here. There's iris, there's lily of the valley, there's gardenia. Um, there's these, there's this, uh, jasmine, which doesn't come across as, you know, the dirty indolic jasmine. There's almost a gentleness to this jasmine, which jasmine and gentle don't always go together. Um, and then there's a brilliant rose and ylang ylang combo. Um, very classically French in style, in execution, and um, it really is beautiful. I mean, it's just a subjectively, to my nose, subjectively beautiful. There's also some vetiver in the dry down. So, I mean, you could make the case that this is a, you know, proper grand chipra, that this might be marketed as unisex today because of the woods, the vetiver into the dry down. And, um... You know, I'll, before this is done, I, I will review this bottle. But uh, the reason it's at number five is because of the fact that when I look at the rest of his creations, when we're at four, three, two, and one, I would always reach for those over this. Always. I just very rarely get the urge to wear something like this. And when I do, the problem is, is when I do decide that I want to wear something like this, it's not Kalesh. You know, I would reach for this over Kalesh all day, every day. Uh, this is absolutely brilliant. Again, um, probably not my style, not in the sense that if you said, Ramsey, create a fragrance for yourself, it wouldn't be this, okay? But wearing this, it, it almost is like a time machine that just transports you right back to those days where the the perfumers of Arpege, Andre Frace and Paul Vacher, um created in in the honeysuckle in this the the little bits and pieces the brilliance of the fragrance and the way that um it all comes together i mean that's so that's the problem kalesh has is there are other fragrances that um you know if i want to wear something like this 
I always seem to reach for ahead of it, which is not fair. I need to sort of prioritize it and wear it and do a video on it and talk about it with you guys because it deserves some some love and and attention. Um, so that is number five. That's Hermes's Kalesh and Doblis. Apparently, Kalesh. So apparently, from what I understand, don't don't quote me on this because I'm not claiming to be an expert uh, because I'm not one. But uh, Doblis apparently came out about six years before Kalesh, and it, um, 1955 it came out, okay, six years before Kalesh, and it's got caraway, chamomile, coriander, jasmine, rose, leather, musk, and oak moss, and apparently Kalesh was like a continuation of Doblis, so they, they, um, added more flowers, they added more aldehydes, they, um, you know, reduce that leather in the base. I think I would love Doblis personally. Like Doblis is a, um, that's one of those unicorn fragrances that I would love to have for the collection one day. But again, bottles are just unbelievably expensive. And the fact that it was made in the same decade as Eau de Hermes and the fact that it's a leather based scent because, you know, Hermes is known for its leather goods and to have leather, a spicy, woody, leathery, uh, floral, animalic. It's also supposed to be animalic. And I think Kalesh evolved from Doblis, from what, from my understanding. Um, but I've never smelled it. So if anyone smelled Doblis, I'd love to get your thoughts in the comments. But number five for me is Doblis. Number four. Number four is a fragrance that I struggle with. And some people say it's the bottle that you have, because I have a vintage bottle. And they say this, the vintage stuff is just harder to dissect. And, and if you get a new bottle, you'll love it even more because Jean-Claude Elena modernized this scent. Um, but this came out in 1970, 1970, and this is, again, Hermes Equipage. So this is what the OG bottles looked like. It had this wheel, um, this big fat wheel in motion cap. Um, and actually, it's interesting because the <coughs> logo on the box, uh, the vintage box, the logo is actually a bunch of guys uh, in like a row, um, like competitive rowing, you know, and uh, but working as a team, sort of. That's That was the imagery that they portrayed with the scent. Um, and this is sort of a spicy, woody, also has a little bit of that leathery base thing that Hermes does, but really, the, the issue that I have with Frank, with, uh, Equipage for me is the fact that Equipage, um, it starts off so, it's such a challenging opening. That's the problem with it. The opening of this is... This would instantly put off 99% of modern perfume, let's say, fragrance connoisseurs, whatever you want to call them. People who are into perfume, 99% of people, I think, would be out instantly at first spray. And very few people have the patience nowadays to wait for the dry down because this fragrance does a course correct. It does course correct itself into better territory. It's this weird... Aldehydic spice is basically the best way to describe it. It's like a, it's like a, how can I describe it? I think it's like a strange aldehydic spice is really the best way to say it because there's mace, um, there's clary sage, which comes across as pretty herbal smelling here, um, the sweaty elements of clary sage um, are here as well, but it comes across as very herbal smelling, and there's rosewood. And so the rosewood for me is like what I cling on to. I'm like a drowning person in the opening of this, just clinging on to that rosewood note, looking for a life preserver, because I love rosewood. It's, it's one of my favorite woods. I've told stories on the channel previously before about why, but... Uh, he's blended it with bergamot and orange in the opening. And that opening is ultra uh, masculine, which normally you would think I would absolutely love. Um, but there's something here that 
I associate with old men, okay? And it's funny because I love vintage fragrances. You'll, I'll wear anything. Like I said, you've seen some of the stuff that I wear day to day to the office. I don't care. Um, stuff from the 80s smells modern to me. You know, stuff from the uh, 20s smells modern to me. But this in particular, I don't know what it is, but there's something about this that I just think this would smell amazing on an old man in shorts, you know, in some sort of, um, let's say, t-shirt that he got for free on a cruise and knee-high uh, athletic socks and, and, um, and white grandpa tennis shoes, right? With not even the tie ones, the damn Velcro ones, right? And as he walks by, they smell this on him. Let's say the young kids smell this on him and they point and laugh and make fun of him. But really, he's got like 50 million bucks in the bank, you know. But he looks like a bum because he doesn't care. He has so much money, he just doesn't give a shit. Um, that's what this smells like to me. It really, it, there is a, a high class sense about it. And I love the cinnamon. I love the pine. Um, I think the way that Hermes ended up building Rocobar later on is like more of a you know, benzoin heavy sort of take on equipage. I think they sort of modernized it with Rocobar. And there's elements here because there's this outdoor feel to both equipage and uh, Rocobar. But I've come to prefer equipage geranium, sort of the um, the one that Jean-Claude Elena ended up doing a flanker of and uh, modernizing. But many people tell me, Ramsey, get the modern version with the black cap and you'll love it. You know, they really toned down that that opening. And see, it's already starting to become much more uh, palatable for me. I love the old school carnation in this. It's so spicy in this scent. The carnation in this scent is extremely spicy and green. And so is the pine. The pine literally makes you feel like you're standing in a forest. So there's this outdoor piney sort of vintage carnation note, which I wish they would use in more men's fragrances with a ton of oak moss and, um, you know, the heft of patchouli and a little bit of tonka and vanilla, but just a little bit. I mean, I, there's no, I don't think there's a soul on earth that would call this a sweet fragrance by any stretch of the imagination. There's also something leathery that comes out, almost like there's a little bit of labdanum or peru balsam or something in the base that is giving it a little bit, maybe there's a tiny touch of castorium, even though it's not listed, but it ends up just turning into this spicy woody scent, which I don't mind. So, you know, an hour or two in, brilliant fragrance, fantastic masculine. But man, that opening, there is just that image of grandpa walking by. I can't shake it. Um, there's just something about this fragrance that smells older than 1970 even, which, you know, from 2023, 1970 seems like a long way away for you guys who lived it and were around in 1970 which I was not, um, but if you were, you're probably like, man, that feels like yesterday, because time is weird, time is a thief, that's what they say, time is a thief, and, um, but there's something about this that just feels vintage -y. even more so than the year that it was made, um, I like it, uh, but I haven't learned to love it yet, is the thing, and I don't know if I ever will, honestly, I need to wear it more, I need to review it for you guys, um, but yes, Equipage from Guy Robert basically comes in at number four. Number three. Now, number three is... I would love a bigger bottle of this one day, but it's so expensive. Um, it's very hard for me to spend money on perfume unless I, I'm really looking for... I'm, I'm like a precision sniper now. I'm not just going and buying everything anymore. Those days for me are over, as you can see. I've already done that. Um, now I'm really looking for like certain things and like my uh what i what i found from rudy which you'll see as an unboxing in the next week or two and also my good friend hari found me a fragrance from Guerlain i've been hunting for you know those little uh one hit snipes find something grab it uh but but you're really looking for something very specific that may be getting harder to find and this would be one of those fragrances but since i already have a bottle it's hard to justify going and getting a bigger bottle i'd love to have like a proper version from 1976, the old school 100 mil, but instead I've got a 30 mil. I'm glad with what I have. So at number um, three, this is Gucci Porom, the original Gucci Porom 
from 1976. Look at the Gucci symbol. Uh, um, the 100 mil bottle has a cap that looks like a belt buckle. Very cool. Looks looks like a Gucci belt buckle with the Gucci, um, you know, tan, green, red, tan belt like fabric here around the bottom of it. Um, and it's a brilliant cap. I would love a bottle of that, but this is amazing. So I think that this is actually better. I would take this over this, over Chanel's Poor Monsieur. Um, you know, in, in the early 70s, in the 70s just in general, you could say, there was this um, modernization of, let's say, the citrus aromatic masculine style fragrance and this is oh come on what happened to the sprayer on this you gotta be kidding me there it goes so man that scared me for a second there um the the downfall of vintage perfume so oh huh oh you know, this almost, almost even leap number two, but I just couldn't do it. I couldn't put this past number two because number two is uh, so iconic and, and number one just ended up stealing my heart. So, um, but Gucci Pour Homme takes that style of fragrances that I talked about on the channel that I'm so underwhelmed with all the time, that sort of citrusy, aromatic, masculine, you know, fragrance with maybe some lavender and that seems a little bit of boring sometimes. And this takes it and makes it unboring. So this is Guy Robert's like modernization on um, Capucci Pour Homme or Chanel Pour Monsieur or Dior Eau Sauvage or right that style. <laughs> and makes it interesting. Kind of like the same way that I think um, YSL Pour Homme and Balenciaga's Ho Hang do similar things in my mind. Um, and this is one of those scents, but the spices in here, man, the way that he somehow made that citrusy opening still stand out, because there is a ton of natural smelling bergamot and lemon, like you're holding the lemon and bergamot in your hand and you can see the details, you can see the details on the rind and you cut it in half, you can see the seeds falling out, you know, it's that fresh. With lavender... Basil, which also smells very fresh in the opening here. Like you're literally just picked the basil from your garden. And some jasmine, sandalwood, the spices though, man. Spices, cedar, carnation, geranium, iris, pepper, patchouli, labdanum, oak moss, vanilla, amber, leather, musk, and tonka bean. And um, I love the leathery dry down in this, you know, this is a style of fragrance I've said many a times bores me. It just does. The citrus aromatic style is not my favorite thing to wear, but this, this is a take on it that is, I think, done to perfection. I think Guy Robert absolutely nailed this one, and that's why I say I would love a bigger bottle, but, you know, juice, as, you know, money constrictions and juice constrictions be what they may, I am very happy to have what I have, but it's probably big bottle, backup bottle worthy. It's that good. Um, the original Gucci Pour Homme from 1976. And he started to do a trick here. Well, you're smelling, if you've smelled this and you've smelled many of his other works, when we get to number one, I'll talk a little bit about this um, sort of labdanum resinous, ambery base that he created that I can smell in Gucci Pour Homme um, that I think he borrowed from a Dior fragrance that I think he really nailed and knocked out of the park. But um, if you have not smelled the original Gucci Pour Homme from 1976, uh, special shout out to Guy Robert for creating this one. It is getting harder and harder to find. And you can see this one is, uh, I don't know what the distributions went through, but this one's scanning. Um, I don't know if it was only scanning or, you know, if someone else made it at some point, but man, this is so good. I need to wear that soon. Maybe I'll wear that tomorrow in honor of Guy Robert. 
So we've got Kalesh at number five, Equipage at number four, Gucci Porom at number three. Number two, I'm cheating a little bit because I stuck two together. Instead of having like a honorary mention from number six, I'm putting number two as two fragrances. And if you know Guy Robert's work, you know exactly what those two are. It's Gold Woman by Amouage and Gold Man together. And the reason they're together is because they smell very similar. They do. Um, so Gold Woman... Uh, is considered sort of a floral oriental. This is a bottle, by the way. This is what their tester bottles, I think, used to look like back in the day, or maybe like their sample press bottles, or I don't know what exactly these were. But if you look at the bottom of the gold woman that I have, you'll see that it says Sultanate of Oman. That's how you know this is an older bottle. This is back when it was literally just owned by the Sultan. But it's not so old that there's not a website, so it's at least, you know, mid-90s, let's say, and, and later. This is probably early 2000s, is my guess. But um, this is the Eau de Parfum, I think. Actually, I don't know. It doesn't say. It just says Gold Woman, made by M. Waj, LLC, Sultanate of Oman. I'm guessing this is the Eau de Parfum and not the X-Ray. Um, I think there was an X-Ray as well, but uh, I'm thinking this is the Eau de Parfum. Um, so this is Rose, Lily of the Valley, Frankincense, Jasmine, Myrrh, Orris Root, Ambergris, Musk, Sandalwood, Cedar, and Civet. And this is a made in UK, which they don't, Emwage no longer has its UK facility. If you look on the bottom and you see some sort of weird number like this, basically, and there's no made in Oman written on there, that usually means it was made in the UK. Um, not always, but uh, especially if you have a magnetic cap. And it's funny because back in the day, people that um, really were into Amouage used to want the Made in Oman bottles because they thought they were better. And now, Made in UK is almost turning into a little bit of a badge of honor because there is no more Made in, in the UK. And it's a way to date the bottle, let's say, to 2020 or so. I think the fish man... Uh, Salmon closed down the UK plant in 2020, if I'm not mistaken. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was like 2020 time frame when they closed the UK plant down because when he took over Amouage, when Christopher Chong left, he wanted to basically do the same thing to Amouage that Chanel does and that they wanted to control everything. So they didn't want their bottles winding up at discounters unless they really made sure they didn't want any leaks or anything like that. And the only way to have an iron fist on distribution was not to have a plant in Oman and a plant in the UK, is to have it all centralized in one place. And that's what he did. <laughs> so if you have an older made in UK bottle, you know it's like before 2019 or whatever it was. Um, I don't know exactly when this one is from. I think this is like a 2015 bottle, give or take, um, is, is my guess. I'm not 100% sure. I don't remember. I did look it up once, but all I can tell you is this is absolutely brilliant. And and I prefer Gold Man. Like, if you made me pick a 2A and a 2B, this would be 2A and this would be 2B. But this is a fantastic fragrance as well. They both have this quality about, about, the, about the fragrance, let's say. The differences are basically this. This feels more animalic from the civet. It feels like that uh, civet hits you harder, faster and last longer and when you smell this this is perfume opulence you know this is when i was saying earlier grand perfume ballroom perfume uh that's basically what this is so you know he um uh, to quote guy robert he basically said you need an orchestra to play a symphony but you can make a great music with just a flute and so some of his simpler compositions apparently were very popular. This is an orchestra. This is an orchestra type perfume. That's exactly what this is. You know, when you spray this, this is ballroom fragrance. Um, it's grand, it's huge, and it really harkens back to his want to recreate Arpege. In my mind, when you smell these, they are linked. They absolutely are linked. And even though Oh my God, it's, it's like, it's like, you know, it's literally like melting liquid gold. It's like powdery, shimmery, 
um, opulence. Like you just melted gold down, gave it to a magician who turned it into powder, and you just threw those gold flakes up in the air. You made it rain with gold flakes, and it just comes down on you. Um, that's the feel of the fragrance. It's powdery, it's opulent, and in this particular version, here they use a, a traditional rose. Here they use what's called dog rose, which is also known as rose hip, and apparently rose hip has this uh, very specific, rich, medicinal use that goes back further in time, all the way to the time of, uh, um, of, um, uh, who was the Greek, uh, he was, uh, he was known for the Hippocratic Oath, Hi Hippocrates, I think it's Hippocrates, um, all the way back to the time of Hippocrates, and, um, so apparently the, uh, roots and blooms and hips were used in these various, um, prescriptions for people, they're like a medicinal uh, rose hips were believed to cure the um, the reason it ended up being known as dog rose collo colloquially is because um, the rumor was it could cure it was so strong and powerful that rose hip could literally cure the bite of a mad dog a rabid dog so it became known as dog rose um, and and it's a it's a little bit of a different type of rose um, and uh, they, they use it here. I don't think they use it here. Uh, I think there's just a, a regular rose note. But that dog rose, I don't know if it's found in Oman, but many of the ingredients inside of Gold Man, the myrrh, the frankincense, um, you know, they, they source directly within Oman because this was supposed to be uh, sort of a, you know, celebration of the country of Oman as well. And the Sultanate of Oman at the time specifically focused on finding Guy Robert because they wanted Guy Robert because they wanted fine French perfumery in a Middle Eastern bottle. They didn't want Middle Eastern style fragrances. They wanted fine French perfumery. And he gave them that in spades with this. What they didn't know they were getting is they didn't know they were getting almost this culmination of a lifetime of dedication to this fragrance, to Arpege, you know, this aldehydic floral style. And, and he gave them this amazing animalic floral that when you go read the blurbs on this fragrance, just go to Fragrance Can Read. If you just want to laugh, go read what some of the people say about this fragrance. It's complete bullshit is what it is. Um, basically, it's just a, it's a uh, lack of historical understanding of how it got to this point is really what it is. And so, you know, you have some 20-year-old kid that is buying niche fragrances because of compliments, because of Aventus and Leighton and stuff like that. And they get to Amouage and they smell this and they go, oh, oh, it smells like grandma's wet feet. And, you know, disregard all that. As a fragrance lover, that means nothing to you. You can just act like, who cares? You know, who cares what they think about this fragrance? This is one of the peak opulent fragrances you can buy. This is like, you know, you, you, you probably would have a very hard time finding something that is more opulent and grand and expensive smelling than this in this style. And when you understand the history and you understand his obsession with, you know, trying to make these floral scents that pay homage to Arpege, and then you go back and smell gold man and gold woman. I mean, this probably should have been number one, honestly. The problem is, is he did a fragrance for Christian Dior that I fell in love with. And I, and I, as soon as I smelled it, actually, it didn't take long. I was like, this is his masterpiece. Like, I don't care what anyone else says. To me, this is his masterpiece because it is the culmination of his trying to find that blend where he can still be himself, but pay homage to Arpege. And the, the number one fragrance for me that does that and I would love, there's another style bottle of this. It comes in this like baby blue, it's just long discontinued, but it's almost like this baby blue, um, uh, you know, covered bottle. Dior uh, is Dior, Dior Essence, but mine is like this. This is the vintage EDT bottles. This bottle's discontinued as well. And of course you can see the old style 
markings and all that good stuff on here. But um, this is a this is basically a floral sheepra as well. You can see he has a style, right? So this is a floral sheepra as well. But where it changes is, listen to the notes. Aldehydes, bergamot, fruity notes, and orange. Sounds normal enough, right? Carnation, rose, cinnamon, geranium, jasmine, orris root, tuberose, violet, and ylang ylang. Still sounds, sounds in line with his previous um, floral sheepras, right? Now listen to the bass. Oak moss, styrax, patchouli, vanilla, vetiver, benzoin, musk. So we have the addition of styrax, which makes the fragrance feel waxy to me. Like the base of the fragrance, the benzoin adds this warmth, you know, like you're being cuddled by your um, most precious cashmere blanket, let's say, by a fire, right? And it, there's just this inherent like warmth, you know, like the boiling of water on a tea kettle. There's just this this energy underneath and the depth and strength of the oak moss and the patchouli and the vanilla and you know this this heavy resinous base um and it's almost like smelling three fragrances and as soon as I smelled it I was like this reminds me of nothing else I've ever smelled except for one fragrance there's one fragrance I smell that smells like this to me and it is Shamad, Guerlain Shamad. Um, Shamad smells like deorescence to me. And what's interesting, except for Shamad has the Guerlain, the Guerlainade in the base, right? Um, this does not have the Guerlainade in the base. But what makes that even more interesting that I stuck those two together is I, when it, whenever my brain sort of put them together, is I didn't realize that these both came out in 1969 which is crazy that they both came out in the same year to me because that tells me Jean-Paul Guerlain, who would also be in the running for, you know, best, let's say, fine French perfume creators. You could put Edmund Rudnitska, you could put Jean-Paul Guerlain, you could put Guy Robert in there, right? Is, you know, Jean-Paul Guerlain was uh, working on his own little concoctions uh, for, for the House of Guerlain, obviously, in... in, in um, in the 60s, and I would love, there's a Parfum de Toilette bottle of Shamad that's also on my, one of those wish lists, that never-ending wish list, right? You could stick that Parfum de Toilette of Shamad and Nehema right next to uh, Doblis. So, yeah, keep your fingers crossed for that one, right? But Dior Essence just, uh, there's a story out there about Guy Robert meeting somebody for a meeting um, talking when they were trying to decide on his creation of this fragrance. And he couldn't decide what it was supposed to smell like. And apparently rumor is that he just bought a brand new hunk of ambergris. A, you know, one of these like big chunks that back in the day were supposed to power a perfume house like Christian Dior for like a decade, right? Like a huge hunk of ambergris. And he was he, he was holding it in his hand and, and smelling it. And, you know, the way you test ambergris apparently is you sort of rub it and get it really, really hot. And, 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 um, you know, there's a way to test it to see the quality and smell and all that stuff. It was different tests, but apparently he was like rubbing it in his hands and he went to a restaurant to go eat and they went to some joint in Paris and he goes to the restroom and they have a fake miss. They have a fake Dior soap. He, they didn't say which one it was, but it was like a knockoff Dior soap. And he washes his hands with this Dior soap. And with the ambergris that's already on his hands, and he's like, I know exactly what Dior Essence needs to be. And apparently there is a huge amount of real ambergris in the base of this fragrance, um, especially in the vintage. But it's a green floral um, resinous. It's that res, it's almost the, the base of it almost makes the fragrance feel like an oriental fragrance, right? So you have this aldehydic floral top, right? You have this heart, huge floral heart, carnation, rose, geranium, jasmine, orris, tuberose, violet, ylang ylang. And then you have the warmth of that cinnamon and then almost the oriental style. You know how MDCI's Shepra Palaton is like a blend of Shepra and oriental and um, Rochas Femme? that Edmund Runitska did, I, I would say is like a blend of Shepra and Oriental. I would almost put this in, in a category like that, 
because of how resinous the waxy styrax in the base makes the fragrance. Um, and as soon as I smelled this, I was like, this is his masterpiece. Absolutely. Even though I know what an unbelievable fragrance Amouage Gold is, to me, this is the fragrance where he just tied everything together. He is 100% at his element here. And I think that base that he ended up making for this made its way into things like Gucci Por Homme, um, and maybe even other creations that he did. So, um, <clears throat> DR Essence, if you've never smelled the vintage, I, I, it is, uh, it's one of my favorite Dior's. I think it's a, um, I think it's an absolute masterpiece. I think it's his masterpiece that deserves more credit. Um, and, I uh, hope you guys appreciated the video. We're at the hour mark, so don't want to make it much longer than this, but, uh, you know, if you have any favorites from Guy Robert that I did not mention, because obviously I don't have all of his creations, do let me know. Let me know what you think about him as a perfumer. Let me know what you think of the uh, very generous gifts from uh, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Very, very kind of you, mate. Seriously, people like you make this, uh, you know, process of making these videos and, and doing this stuff for you guys much easier when you don't have to come out of, out of your, your own pocket for expensive things like this and you, and you can still wear them and enjoy them and talk about them on the channel. So thank you, Jeff. Very kind of you. Thank you to everyone who watches and comments and does all the things that help the channel grow. We're almost at 4,400 subscribers, which may not sound a lot to other people, but to me, it's a lot. And I'm very happy with each and every one of my uh, subscribers. And, um, you know, it's uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to get to do these videos for you. So thank you, everybody. Cheers, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.